Hi guys, this is Dr. Gillard. Uh, as promised, this is your review for the final differential diagnosis 2, which is lumbar spine, spring of 2015. And off we go. We're going to focus, after I've written the test and kind of looking back at it, I think if you focus on 7, 8, 9, and 10, you will do quite well, and that's what we're going to focus on right now. So let's go for the review. Actually, i got to throw week six in there too. It looks like that's on there as well. So let's see. So you definitely, with regard, this is obviously a spondylolisthesis. So you definitely want to know the Wilts classifications of spondylolisthesis. Remember what they were? Degenerative spondylolisthesis, ismic spondylolisthesis, traumatic spondylolisthesis, iatrogenic, and dysplastic spondylolisthesis. Know what a spondylopetosis is. Know what that step sign or step off sign is. You guys did pretty good on that on your quizzes. You definitely want to know what this is. This is discogenic spondylosis. So we have a normal disc here. You see the end plates look pretty good, and here you have very thick end plates. Uh, so that so what has happened here? So it's probably killed the feeding system to the disc. Remember the marrow channels and how the disc gets nutrients basically by diffusion through the subchondral bone of the end plates. So that's probably what's happened here. But this is discogenic spondylosis. Uh, remember the cage slip here. I don't think you need to worry about that though. Definitely need to worry about this though. So remember this is the history is the key. The patient had low back pain, never had back pain in his life, had a dental procedure three weeks ago, and now he has back pain and now his disc is gone. Right? Here's a normal disc. And so we have all this fluffy looking bone here. This is an infection. So we have discitis and we have osteo uh, osteomyelitis as well so infection discitis either one of those osteomyelitis you gotta say discitis right the disc is completely gone you can see a little protective casing here around this pocket of pus we even have a little what's this even a little retrolysthesis there right because of the sloppiness now what happens when the disc decreases ligamentum flavum gets slack and now we got some extra play here. So retrolisthesis on top of that. Now we talked about this. This is actually my MRIs. So this is a failed microdiscectomy. So what's going on here? Status post, microdiscectomy, continued left radicular pain. Make sure you remember that this is the left side. These images are always reverted. This is the right side, left side. And this is the axial view of the disc, a little protrusion here. But Mickey Mouse is still good. Here's the thecal sac. This would be the what? If this is L5 disc, that's the left, right S1 traversing nerve root. This is the right exiting L5 nerve root. There's the left exiting L5 nerve root. And where is the traversing S1 nerve root on the left? It's hidden in all this stuff. So that's either scar tissue or it's a recurrent disc herniation. Sometimes it's hard to tell. So what do you do to fix that? You order a gadolinium-based MRI, and it usually can kind of light up and, and show you the difference here. So what do you call this? I mean, the bottom line, I'm digressing a little bit. This is epidural fibrosis, or you could call it perineural fibrosis, status post microdiscectomy. That's what you would call that. Yeah, here's gadolinium right here. This is without gadolinium. This is the one we saw. See how the gadolinium, it makes the scar tissue go away? We can see there's high, there's the nerve root there. I don't see any new herniation there. You can see what, though? You got a little osteophyte sticking right in there to make things worse. Okay. Definitely want to know about Xarelto and that's one of the newer medications, blood thinner. And the other one, uh, the one that's been around forever, is Warfin. 
aka Coumadin. So those are yellow flag, yellow flags if your patient's taking that, which means you can adjust. You should warn them, they might bruise, but you should not, remember Dr. Souza said, they should not use uh, grade five manipulation, only activator, SOT, soft uh, chiropractic techniques that won't damage things. And you know these are going to show up again, the red flags, make sure saddle paresthesia is kind of a weak one, I think. Uh, but progressive or, se se or severe neurological f deficit, so if you're treating a patient, all of a sudden they develop foot drop, off they go to the hospital, or they can't heal toe walk anymore, or if their pain is so severe, it's not relieved by removing gravity, i.e. laying down in bed or reclining. Or, call, of course, if there's bowel or bladder, uh, which one, bowel or bladder symptoms, cauticoina, which one's more common? What's what's the, the the finding, what the patient will have? Will he wet himself? Typically not. He typically won't be able to go to the bathroom. And remember, patients read on the Internet this stuff, and sometimes they get a little nervous, and they get a little hesitation. But, I mean, they won't be able to go to the the bathroom. Remember, we saw. We'll see in a little while. Uh, remember, a, bl a neurogenic bladder. It just gets huge. You can't go. You have to go to the emergency and get catheterized. So, these are definite red flags out of your office. Definitely know this again. My mnemonic here: high pros never idle. That'll give you all the components. There's definitely a question on here where you have to know all the components, or you'll get it wrong. History inspection, palpation, range of motion, orthopedic testing, neurological testing, and imaging. We won't worry about the, the mnemonic for history. Definitely need to know minor sign. Remember minor sign? What does it mean? Does it mean disc herniation or facet syndrome? It means very nonspecific. It just means your patient is in a world of hurt and you're uh, antennas need to come out and really look for red flag signs because you're not going to see this too often and you have to be very careful that uh, something's not seriously wrong like a fracture so be careful with patients like this okay let's see what else here we did step off you guys did well on that anyway we're zipping along here. Definitely need to know the key orthopedic test for disc herniation. We have the slump, straight leg raise, back cruise. Back cruise is also the seated straight leg raising test. Uh, well, leg, well leg raise test, Valsalva's test. So you should know just slightly about what they are. But more importantly, know that these five tests are for disc herniation. And slump is probably the best one we have for board purposes in the real world it's such a comprehensive test uh, I don't think you're gonna get through it with someone with a real cute disc they'll walk out of your office or sock you in the nose so I like straight leg raise better um, than slump okay speeding along we need to make sure you know your dermatones again uh, you don't need to know too much about this study. Know your dermatones, especially your foot. Uh, know from medial, this is the medial foot, lateral foot. So L4 is the inside of the foot, of course. Top of the foot is L5. S1 is the lateral foot. And definitely you want to read through the Hancock study here. Uh, this is pretty good uh, because some of the most important diagnostic uh, or pieces to the diagnostic puzzle will come from the history. If the patient complains of specific dermatone pain, uh, like he says, Doc, I got this horrible pain down my leg, and you say, where exactly is it? You know, it's like somebody poured uh, hot acid on the top of my foot. It's right on the top of my foot. You immediately think, oh, he's got a, an L5 nerve root problem. And that's actually more accurate than dermatone testing, reflex testing, and muscle testing, uh, according to this study, at least. Uh, and in my clinical experience, that's pretty much true. Uh, the patient, if you can dig that history exactly where the pain is, uh, that's a good thing. You should always include a pain diagram in your, uh, in your new patient packet to see, let them draw where that pain is. You know these tests, of course, 
L4 is heel walk. I don't really like that, but this picture here. These are out of the old Hoppenfeld, but uh, L4 is heel walk. L5 is extensor hallucis longus. S1, I don't like this at all. Too hard to test that, but you can have them do calf raises, single leg calf raises. If he's got left radicular pain, test the right leg to have him do 10 calf raises against the wall. Uh, then get on his bad leg and see how many he can do, and that can give you a good piece of the puzzle. That's actually a very quick way. I think there's actually a question. What's a quick way to do a neurological screening? You can have him heel-toe walk, uh, and then you can have him get up from a chair to test the quadriceps. That's a real quick way to do, but it's valuable information. When I do my online coaching, I do the same thing. I use go to meeting, and I... I the I can see what the patient's doing no matter where in the world he is and I will say okay let's see you walk on your heels let's see you walk on your calves okay if he can walk on his calves let's put him against the wall and do one calf at a time let's see him get out of a chair if his wife's there I'll have him test L5 what's L5 remember L5 that is extensor hallucis longus where is it there it is. So have have him dorsiflex his big toe. Have his wife pull it down. Compare it to the other side. You can you can glean a lot of important information by that very quickly. Okay, let's speed through this. We talked enough about that. Talked about the importance of a three Tesla MRI. You don't go to an open MRI unless the patient's severely claustrophobic you'll get crummy images. Radiologists won't probably tell you that. And you want to make sure that I like 2 to 2.5 millimeter cuts uh, through the disc so you get at least two pictures of the disc. If they do 4 millimeter cuts you might miss the entire disc. And the radiologist in my experience won't tell you that either. You don't know how many terrible MRIs that I have to have the client repeat uh, because they've missed the cut. Sometimes they don't angle the, the slice down the disc or they completely miss the cut. So I digress again. Let's see where we are here. I mean obviously know your herniations. This is obviously a sagittal. Is this a mid-sagittal view? No, you can see the vertebral canal is narrowed so this has got to be a parasagittal in fact it's right through the lateral recess here of the L4 disc so when you're naming this you got to be specific or I'm going to take half off if you say disc herniation I might not give you any points because you're beyond that now you should say it's a what kind of disc herniation is it it's way bigger than seven millimeters right canal is 20 millimeters and this is at least half the canal so I said anything over cell seven center or seven millimeters sorry everything was millimeters there anything over seven millimeters uh, is you can be pretty sure it's an uh, extrusion so you can see a left paracentral meaning it's not mid sagittal it's off to the central uh, disc extrusion in the left lateral recess so you need to be more specific at least tell me it's a disc herniation on the left at L4 and I'll probably give you the points but you should say it's a paracentral disc herniation might be in a bad mood and not give you all points if you don't say it's paracentral you should know that foraminal herniation would be here extra foraminal herniation would be out here where the dorsal root ganglion is you know the treatments don't have to go over those I really like inversion tables by the way it might actually stimulate some diurnal change I mean, none of these treatments, uh, not even Cox, has a great, really proven placebo-controlled trial. There's nothing that shows it really works. But the idea is to stimulate diurnal change and help Mother Nature help heal these herniations. Water exercise is good for the core. I am not a fan of grade 5 manipulation uh, for disc herniations, period. I know there's some research. I know, I think our school policy is you can do it, but I am just not a fan of it because I've known too many people have been sued over it. Here's an article from Canada. Um, and the bottom line is what in the world can a grade 5 manipulation do for a herniated disc? I mean you have a tear through the annulus, you have material on the outside. The, to, I mean common sense, if I was sitting on the jury, the 
the force on a grade five manipulation would probably irritate the healing or maybe even squirt more material out. So, you know, I just don't see it. I would you definitely use flexion distraction treatment. Uh, although I want to be a neutral professor on the other side of the fence, you know, here's a uh, here's a paper from Sweden, I believe it was, uh, that says it's safe to use grade five manipulation. But if you use grade five manipulation on a herniated disc, then it, that was an asymptomatic herniated disc and it was a facet problem. Remember, 30% of small protrusions, people over 40, there's a false positive for it. Go to construction site, 30% of people over the age of 40 will have small disc protrusions, but not big ones. I digress again. Spondylolisthesis, there's a lot on spondylolisthesis. Make sure you know, oh, let's, uh, we'll digress, but this is, you need to know this. So what's going on here with this picture? Okay, where the heck's the bone? So all the marrow's been destroyed, infiltrated by cells growing wild. See, here's the marrow signal. Should look like that. So this has got to be some form of cancer. What's in the spine, it's almost always metastatic disease. Here's the T2-weighted image. Uh, now we can see the outline of the bone, at least. And you can see its expanse. Uh, the vertebrae is greatly expanded. So this is uh, metastatic disease from the breast. Metastatic carcinoma, secondary to primary of breast cancer. I would study that picture if I were you. Definitely know what a dysplastic spondylo is. Remember, those are the big ones, right? Uh, those allow, that's a, a malformation or maybe even a complete absence of the L5S1 facet joints. And it allows this huge slip. So this only can happen in... I mean, nine times out of ten, this can almost always is a dysplastic spondylolisthesis. And make sure you know that's called a what? Spondylopetosis. Uh, and know the fix would be interbody fusion. If you see this, all you got to say is lumbar interbody fusion. I won't go into the details of it again, but lumbar interbody fusion. And what's this? So spondylolysis, we have breaks through the pars interarticularis. It might be a tiny, tiny slip. If you want to call this a spondylo, what kind would it be? According to the Wilt system. Good, that is a ismic spondylolysis, if you want to call it that. I prefer you just say bilateral spondylolysis at L4, L5. Make sure you say that or you get points off. What's this? Okay, this is a grade one, maybe getting close to grade two, but it's an ismic spondylolisthesis. What's the fix again? If everything else fails, it's a inner body fusion, lumbar inner body fusion. This is a transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion. Now, definitely you want to know, we talked about this in class, what are those three little markers there? Those are little metallic markers that are placed inside the inner body spacer, or the cage they used to call it, inner body spacer. Remember when they do an inner body fusion, they remove the nucleus propulsus and some of the annulus, and they put a spacer in to jack up to simulate the disc again. Now this one couldn't, they couldn't jack this one up far enough, or they couldn't connect, correct the spondylolisthesis. But, so th those are cage markers is the bottom line. I would know that. I definitely need to know this. You guys didn't do very good on this a couple times. This is on the attendance quiz. So what's going on here? Well, we got a obviously a bulging disc, a degenerated disc, ligamentum flavum thickening. We have severe central stenosis. That's a good one. So that's worth mentioning. What else? What's caused it? Ligamentum flavum has in the bulging haven't helped, but look at the slip. We have a massive slip here on this side. This is a degenerative spondylolisthesis that slipped. Remember, the facets and degenerative spondylolisthesis, the facets fail, and the entire vertebral arch slides forward and guillotines can guillotine the thecal sac and the lateral recess or the exiting uh, the neuroforamina here can be guillotined. So that's what's happened here. So the big diagnosis is here. Top two are degenerative spondylolisthesis and severe central stenosis. I would know that one. 
you know what that is already. That's a sacralization of L5 with neoarthrosis. Doesn't look like it. Just spatulization of the transverse process, but unilateral uh, sacralization. Okay, this one we'll revisit, maybe not this picture though, which wasn't very good in the first place, but we have a severe osteoporosis. We have multiple compression fractures. All of these are compression. When we see that, immediately we think multiple myeloma. Multiple myeloma. Don't call that cancer. I won't give you any points. Multiple myeloma. Okay, so I think we pretty much went over all these. Okay, the parts should know the the uh, the parts here. You should definitely be able to tell me what the pink star is. So that's the thecal sac. That's the right. Remember, these are always reversed. That's the right traversing S1 nerve root. That is the right exiting nerve root, or you could say the right dorsal root ganglion. Make sure you know that. Definitely need to know this Wilts classification. I think I said that already. Ismic degenerative traumatic pathological iatrogenic. Now, what the heck does that mean? What the heck is that iatrogenic spondylolisthesis? Let me give you an example. What do we do for the treatment of a patient with stenosis? I mean, if everything else fails, let me go back to that picture real quick. I think we've got stenosis here somewhere. Okay, so let's pretend this isn't here, but let's pretend we have stenosis. So if everything else fails and they have to go to surgery, we need to decompress and open this up. So they do what's called a laminotomy. They cut all the lamina out here, right? And here's the posterior arch, is the slingshot. They cut a lot of the lamina out, pars intraarticularis, and thin this out uh, to make room. If they need to go into the foramen, it's called a foraminotomy. And collectively, it's just called a decompression. So bottom line is that might work really good, but that's going to be a weak spot. So let's say a patient who's had a decompression is out playing tennis, slips and falls right on their butt. Here's a crack and now has horrible pain. So you take an x-ray and now they have an isthmic spondylolisthesis. So I'm trying to talk and do this at the same time. Um, so you don't call it an ismic spondylolisthesis anymore because of their status post decompression. So it's an iatrogenic spondylolisthesis. It's man-made. Okay, let's see what else. Got them all over the place. Talked about that. Talked about that. Talked about that. Sorry, you can tell I'm just kind of throwing this together here for you. There's where we were. Iatrogenic. Um, talked about that. You should definitely know that. Ismic spondylolisthesis is prevalent in young athletes, especially gymnastics, football, the throwing events of track and field. Definitely need to know the Fredericks and Butler study. There's a couple questions on this. Uh, you need to know 500 children, consecutive children, were x-rayed, followed for about 19 years. They found 4% of them had spondylolysis spondylolisthesis. You know, it's kindergartners walking around with that, but they didn't have any pain. I don't, although they, they didn't say that for sure, but the bottom line is, though, no, I think they were all asymptomatic for the most part. The bottom line is by the time 25 had come along, 81% uh, of them, the slip had worsened. So that's definitely need to know that. And 52%, about half of them, were having trouble with their backs. 10% actually had spinal surgery, which is pretty darn rare, 
before the age of 25. If they would have followed him to, to the age 55, I bet that would jump to 25%. So having a spawn blow at young age is typically not, doesn't bode terribly well for the future. And the other interesting thing to know, the, an, in a sister study, not the same people, but 500 newborns were x-rayed. They didn't find a single spondylolisthesis. So these are definitely uh, induced somehow, probably when the baby starts walking. Let's see, what else do we need to say here? So treatment, we need to talk about that. So they come into your office, you need to have them avoid extension and hyperextension for two to three months while you treat them. Again, I'm not a big believer in grade five manipulation. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? You want this, this is a fracture, you don't adjust a fractured fibula. So I don't think you should be adjusting a fractured uh, posterior arch. Uh, but you can certainly work on their core you can do some uh, muscle work, some therapy, and things like that, but have them avoid extension. If that doesn't work, put them in a brace for three to six months. I mean, you do everything you can to avoid fusion at such a young age. Water exercise is good. You might need to do, make some limitations, disabilities, uh, but it's definitely safe, hint, safe to work on the core. You can do core work. You definitely don't want them taking anti-inflammatories. Remember, uh, when bone heals or when bone is created, part of the process involves an inflammation. So you don't want to snuff out that or you will, in, you will hinder healing. Same as someone has a fusion. You don't let them take anti or NSAIDs or any type of anti-inflammatory after fusion or they won't fuse and they'll be miserable for the most part. So no NSAIDs. And I think manipulation is contraindicated. Uh, okay, we don't need to worry about We talked about that already. What do we call that? Lumbar inner body fusion because we can see the cage. There's other types. There's a posterior lateral fusion with instrumentation where you don't mess with the disc. There's no cage. It's not inner body. But when you can see the cage, lumbar inner body fusion. Degenerative, you know I like the degenerative spondylos. Remember, it's a slip of the posterior arch. Eh, wrong. It's not, It's there's nothing wrong with the posterior arch. It's a slip of the facet joints. When the, the fracture of the posterior arch is ismic spondylolisthesis. Okay, so it's a slip of the facets, causes it, is the results in degenerative spondylolisthesis. Also know that it seldom exceeds 30%. So you're not going to get, you might get a grade 2 at the most, but they're usually grade 1s. They're not certainly not grade 4s. I need to know that stuff. Okay, here's another one. Uh, no, we've seen that one. We talked about bracing, right? So do you, do you, uh, when you're treating somebody, you know, they avoid hyperextensions, then you put them into a brace. Do you have them do McKenzie exercises? Absolutely not, because those are extension exercises, at least the extension McKenzie's, you absolutely do not have them do.